And they talked for about 45 minutes in Don Ofer's penthouse in Tel Aviv. And then they went down the elevator. And at the end of the ride, he didn't, he didn't like make his pitch in the elevator, but at the end of the ride, Don Ofer put his arm on Shai Agassi's shoulder and said, I'm in for a hundred million dollars. Okay, that is the example, that is the example of an elevator pitch, a successful elevator pitch. Um, Idan Ofer eventually put in a few hundred million dollars, all told by the time Better Place was unfortunately out of business five years after it started, the company had raised 850 million dollars from big names like uh, Morgan Stanley and HSBC and Idan Ofer is the Israel Corporation and, and Maniv Mobility. Uh, it, was, it was known in Israel as, as the company that was going to put the, you know, put the country on the map, not that the country's not on the map, but in terms of like, you know, green and sustainable you know, technology. It was very, very exciting. Idan Ofer and Shai Agassi, until the end, were almost inseparable. They were, they were like, like I said, it was like a bromance, except that at the end, it was Shai Agassi who got fired by Idan Ofer. So. Now, how exciting was this time? In 2008, in right there in the middle, Shai Agassi was on the cover of Wired magazine. He was named the Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential Entrepreneurs of the Year. Idan Ofer loved this company so much, he, that's his yacht there on the right. And you can see he put the Better Place logo on the sails. He called his yacht the good ship Better Place. Now, Shai Agassi was incredibly charismatic. Um, and he loved to perform and to, to be on stage. So Better Place also came on the map when in 2009 he gave a TED Talk, which was seen by over a million people. It went totally viral. And I have a, a brief one minute clip, of a few excerpts from that talk, so you can sort of see what he looked like and, and see if you can just tell me who he's emulating in his dress in the way he's dressed. Steve oh, got, okay, there we go, that, was, that wasn't. You run a whole country without oil. That's the question that uh, sort of hit me in the middle of a Davos afternoon about four years ago, and it, it never left my brain, and I started playing with it more like a puzzle. The original thought I had, this must be ethanol, so I went out and researched ethanol and found out you need the Amazon in your backyard in every country. Uh, about six months later, I figured out it must be hydrogen. Sort of through a, a process of wandering around, I got to the thought that actually if you could convert an entire country to electric cars in a way that is uh, convenient and affordable, you could um, get to a solution. But one of them, Carlos Ghosn, CEO of Renault and Nissan, when asked about hybrids, said something very fascinating. He said, hybrids are like mermaids. When you want a fish, you get a woman, and when you need a woman, you get a fish. <laughs> In Denmark, we will drive all the cars in Denmark from windmills, not from oil. In Israel, we've asked to put a solar farm in the south of Israel. And people said, oh, that's a very, very large space that you're asking for. And we said, what if we had proven that in the same space we found oil for the country for the next 100 years? And they said, well, we tried. There isn't any. And we said, no, no, but what if we prove it? And they say, well, you can dig. And we decided to dig up instead of digging down. Better Place had offices all over the world, and we can decide whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing in a moment, but um, headquarters was actually in Palo Alto. The company was incorporated in Delaware, but really headquarters was in Rosha Ayan in Israel. Um, there were offices and operations in Denmark, the Netherlands, France, uh, Austria, uh, um, Japan, China, Hawaii, and Canada. So there were, there were, all, Australia. and Australia, thank you, Adrian, and Australia. So they, they, they were all over the place. And, uh, and really, you know, you know, we don't remember them anymore. And, and one of the reasons that I, I found it important to write this book is that so many people either didn't hear about Better Place or don't remember the Better Place story. But at the time, they were really a big, big deal. I want to explain why I wrote this book, OK? I want to give you a personal story. And you can see, yep, yeah, that's Jody and I there um, in 2012 on the right. Um, so Better Place built this amazing visitor center and sales room, or sales center, in um, a place called Pigli Lot, which is near uh, Herzliya in, in, Tel in the Tel Aviv area. And they offered people to come and do test drives 
and to see this amazing movie with like you know, you know the polar bears, you know, you know, on you know melt melting ice caps and pollution and like better place than riding into the you know the frame is the solution to the world's problems and you know getting the world you know away from you know countries that don't necessarily like Israel. It was an exciting movie and the test drive you know was 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 powerful if you've never driven an electric car. It's it's really an amazing experience. So we were in, we were looking for something to do on a summer day. It was August 2012, and we were the whole family. And we had gone to the beach, and we'd been to the museums, and you know we we'd gone to the water park. We'd done everything that you do as a family in the summer. And we were looking for something else to do. And so we said somebody suggested, let's go drive an electric car. So we piled the family into our you know our 1995 Toyota Corolla. <laughs> which which we had up until only a few months ago when we gave it to our to our young our, our middle daughter who got married um, and we piled into the car and we went to the Better Place Center and we did our test drives and by the end of that test drive we had fallen in love we fell in love with this car so fast and so hard that within two weeks we had wired the money from America to pay for the car we bought the car and. Before the car arrived, that was right when the company started to get into trouble. That's when Shayagasi got fired. And we thought, uh-oh, this is not good. And, and we called up the, the salesman and said, can we return the car? And he said, uh, you, your car's already here. It's, we've already put the, the logo on. You've got your license plate. And we thought, this doesn't feel good, but we decided we would give it a chance and unfortunately nine months later the whole company went out of business. When that happened, I, I realized something. I am somebody who does incredible amounts of research. You know, if I'm going to go on a vacation, I will spend, you know, days, hours, weeks, I don't know, you know, looking at every possible hotel and destination and flight, okay, you know, longer than the actual vacation will last. If I'm going to buy a hard drive, a $69 you know, portable hard drive, I will spend you know, nine hours researching every possible hard drive. Okay? I didn't do that for this company. I just said, let's, let's do it. I mean, Jody, Jody, we were there. We, like, we just bought the car and didn't... You know, it must have been that we would have noticed something was wrong if we had done our research. And I thought, I got to do my due diligence. In the venture capital world, it's called doing your due diligence. You look and make sure the company is doing okay. And so I started interviewing people. I started like, you know, talking to people and trying to figure out what happened. And before you knew it, I had interviewed like 80 people at the company and I had, you know, gone through, you know, hundreds of articles and videos and 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 you know, PowerPoint presentations. And I realized that there's a really interesting story here. Um, so this book, this book is my due diligence. It took three and a half years to write, edit, edit publish, and promote, which this is the promotion part, so I guess we're still in the three and a half years. Um, one thing that people love to, to hear about, I, I've discovered as I've been doing these talks, is some of the kind of clandestine journalistic work that went into writing a book you know, with so many interviews. And I want to tell you a couple of stories. Um, the first one is of Edan Ofer's butler, okay? That's the one that, that, that's there at point number um, four. So Edan Ofer, miss, you know, the billionaire, um, I worked on him for months trying to get him to agree to be interviewed. And, you know, he's too busy, he's out of the country, who am I, some pipsqueak, you know, he doesn't know me from Adam. Finally, like a day before, it was Pesach, it was Holomo at Pesach, and he says, okay, come tomorrow at 2 p.m. So I dropped whatever it is I was doing, said to the family, sorry, we're not going to the beach or whatever we're going to do, and it wasn't the beach, it was Pesach. But, um, and, and I went to go visit him, and he lives on the penthouse at One Rothschild Boulevard. Now, I, I realize most of you probably don't know One Rothschild, but this is like one of the fanciest buildings in the entire country. It's a skyscraper looking directly over the Mediterranean, Jaffa is to the left, Everything else going up towards Natanya's to the right. Gorgeous view. He's got the whole floor, you know, you know, decks, you know, going around the entire building. His own private butler who's serving us Pesach cookies. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so I do the interview, and he gives me three hours. It was amazing. I sat for three hours interviewing him, and he was totally candid. Nothing off the record. 
And near the end of the, the, the meeting, um, the doorbell rings. So the butler goes over to her and answers the door, and in walks, who could it be? Oh, his yeah. very, what? No, not Shia Gossi. <laughs> um, his very good friend, Ehud Olmert. Oh. Okay? This was before he went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Ehud Olmert comes up to me, and like, you know, Ivan Ofer introduces me to him, and he shakes my hand, and, and he's like, good grip, and he wants to get to know me, and he's incredibly personal and it's like that really at that moment I realized why he became prime minister I mean think what you will one way or the other about about his policies and his about eventual you know corruption but boy was he charismatic so that was the first and only prime minister I've met um, and also the first and only uh, Israeli billionaire that I've met um, another interesting story which is kind of funny is that there was a guy who worked for better place who wrote a blog about Better Place, but all in code. So he like, you know, the Better Place car was really a toaster and, uh, and they were building something else that, you know, had Jetson, you know, motif. And it was all in code, but anybody who worked at Better Place got what it was about. He never gave, gave his name in the blog. And when he contacted me and said, I'm willing to be interviewed, he refused to give me his name. He didn't have a Facebook page or a LinkedIn page, so he didn't know what he was looking like. We agreed to meet in a cafe in Tel Aviv. I'm sitting there with my laptop and looking all around. Finally, this guy comes up to me. We did the interview. I still, to this day, do not know his name. <laughs> and uh, uh, that, that's, the, that's the level of sort of the, the fun that we had, you know, sort of doing it. And the last point here about Shai Agassi, because I know you're going to ask, so I'm going to tell you. What does Shai Agassi think about the fact that I wrote this book? Did he talk to me? The answer is no, he did not talk to me. This is an unauthorized corporate biography. Um, he was very concerned at that time um, when I started writing the book that he wasn't going to get a fair shake. And I spent a lot of time on the phone and emails trying to convince him that I just wanted to tell the story honestly and objectively, and I wasn't out to, to get him. But he didn't believe me, and so he didn't agree. Um, to be interviewed. So when you read the book, when you buy the book and, re and, and read it, you'll see there's lots of quotes from Shai Agassi. And part of, the, part of the, the sort of magic of writing this book was reconstructing dialogue and putting you, the reader, into rooms and dialogues and, and meetings and, and conferences that, that I wasn't at and that Shai Agassi didn't tell me about. I, I got other people to tell me and I got transcripts and um, so, but you know, if he had spoken to me, it would be even richer. So, what went wrong? I'm going to give you a few ideas tonight. I'm not going to give you everything because the book is 300 pages and there's, there's lots of detail and more juicy tidbits that I could share tonight, but I will give you a few ideas. But people always ask me, you know, that's the question they ask, what happened? What crashed this company? And everybody has an idea. They have their own theories. It was Renault, the car manufacturer. They said, you know, they, they messed up. Or it was Shai Agassi. He managed the company wrong. Or it was Idan Ofer there in the, in the bottom middle. You know, he, uh, if he only had more patience, you know, and lasted longer than the company would have survived. Oh, no, it was the state of Israel, you know, here on the, on the right. That they'd supported electric cars more than the company would have succeeded. And the real answer is, and this is kind of, um, not so exciting because everyone wants to say he did it or he did it but the answer is they all did it the, the answer is everyone was to blame and no one was to blame it was a perfect storm of business assumptions that changed so you know when you write uh, when you when you start a company you write a business plan and you have to put down assumptions of what you think is going to happen because that's you know how you write a business plan um, and you say, okay, this is going to cost X, and this is going to cost Y, and people are going to buy it from this segment or that segment. And as you go along in the company, your assumptions that you set forward change, and then you adjust the plan. Um, well, in Better Place's case, everything changed almost at once. And Better Place had to make a choice. What do we do with all these changes? And we'll get to that in a moment. But let's go through what some of those changes were. So the first one was the price, and you had asked about the price. So Shai Agassi spent a lot of time um, talking about how this car would be free, or it would be a $10,000 car, or it would, be, it would certainly be cheaper than a gasoline-powered car. 
But when the car came to market, the price was $35,000. That is not a free car. That's not a cheap car. Um, by Israeli standards, that's a, that's a five-seat sedan. That's not a Tesla. That's just a, an ordinary, that's what we paid for our, for our Toyota Corolla or a, or a Mazda 3 or a Honda Civic. That's a $35,000 car in Israel. But um, the Renault Fluence was supposed to be free and people were disappointed. The second thing that happened was the branding for the car was not unique. Now I want you to look at these two pictures. The one on the left, the white one, is a gasoline-powered Renault Fluence. The one on the right is the Renault Fluence ZE. ZE stands for Zero Emissions. What happened is that Renault released both a gasoline-powered car and an electric version of their car at the same time. And they made them look almost identical. I can't tell the difference, can you? I mean, if I come over here, really little, there's a circle for the, for the charge point there, right? And this grill is a little different because there's no, you know. But now think about a Prius. Think about a Prius. Does a Prius look different than any other car you've ever seen? Yes. Does a Tesla look different? Yes. Does a Chevy Bolt look different? Yes. There's, there's no sex appeal there. Like, people just didn't, didn't get excited by it. On top of which, the, the Renault brand in Israel is not a very highly regarded brand. You know, if, you, if you're going to buy a, you know, a, a five-seat sedan, you go with a Japanese car, a Hyundai from Korea, you don't go with the Fluence. That's the car that you go with if you, you, know, you don't have a lot of money. But this car is costing $35,000, so problem number two.